Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here. I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's Hammer Forum on Immigration with Hector Bereton, Antonio Gonzalez, and Elizabeth Kennedy, and moderated by Ian Masters. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of The Daily Briefing every Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m., as well as Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m., all on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia, and all of you for coming tonight to examine the immigration debate from both the humanitarian and political perspective. Although it does seem that the two are mutually exclusive in the current climate of gridlock and partisanship, particularly ahead, ahead of an election where apparently you can't do something that is both the right thing to do and good for the country. Unfortunately, today the House and the White House have so demonized each other that it's impossible to imagine a presidential signing ceremony on any bill. Sadly, there is no such thing as a win-win in Washington politics, where both sides can take credit for doing something in the national interest that is both good politics and good policy. That is not to say that immigration as a political issue is not a thorny one. But when you contrast it with something like repairing the nation's dilapidated infrastructure at a time of record low interest rates with underemployment in the construction sector, with a public-private infrastructure bank in the offing, and labor and business on the same side, yet we can't even get a bill on it, something that's both nonpartisan and a no-brainer. So if we can't even get something done on that, what chance is there for emigration reform? And then when you add nationalism, xenophobia, racism, and nativism to the mix, on top of the political confusion of unlikely coalitions of liberal Latino activist groups on the same page with conservative agribusiness, and conservative anti-immigration Minutemen in step with liberal labor unions, immigration reform begins to look daunting indeed. But it was not long ago that George, President George W. Bush got elected with over 40% of the Latino vote. And as he identified himself in his Spanish language political ads, Jorge Bush worked with Teddy Kennedy and John McCain to put comprehensive immigration reform on the fast track. But clearly something happened to de derail it, and I hope our two political experts tonight can both answer the questions about what went wrong, and more importantly, what can be done to get us back on the rails and kickstart this crucial issue back to the front burner of political priorities. Meanwhile, the pain, the anger, and the insult simmers beneath the surface as we count down the weeks to the election in a shameful moral vacuum in which one party appears to have put the issue on hold out of a cowardly fear that the other party might use the A word, amnesty, against them. And then we have the other party that is fighting amongst itself over how much the Tea Party wants to fire up angry white men against how much the so-called rhinos don't want to alienate the fastest growing political constituency in the land, as Mitt Romney did with his call for self-deportation, for which he paid dearly in the last election. We are grateful to have Elizabeth Kennedy start off the conversation tonight, setting the humanitarian context, and since she works with returned youth escaping gang violence, explaining the dire choices that are compelling young El Salvadorans to flee north. Not encouraged by mythical billboards, I understand, or by their parents, who know full well the dangers their children face on the hazardous and often merciless journey that they face, but by an environment and conditions that she is uniquely qualified to describe. Then we will hear from Hector Barreto, who is tasked with offering up the Republican perspective on immigration reform. No longer in government, he is free to offer up his own point of view, which I suspect will elevate the conversation above the current stalemate and perhaps make a case for why Jorge Bush was able to attract a good chunk of the Latino vote that the Democrats are not necessarily destined to be the exclusive beneficiaries of into the future. 
Then finally we'll hear from Antonio Gonzalez, who is mad at me for giving him the job of making the case on immigration reform for the Democrats, since he's mad at the Democrats, <laughs> and particularly liberal Democrats like Al Franken, who along with endangered Democratic Senators Kay Hagan, Mary Landrieu, and Mark Pryor, engineered the recent electoral electoral capitulation of executive action on immigration reform that was promised by President Obama before the upcoming election. After the brief presentations by our guests, we will have a conversation amongst ourselves, then have some lively Q&A with you, our audience. Elizabeth Kennedy is an activist scholar who focuses on the experiences and needs of child, youth, and forced migrants. She recently published a report in the Journal of, American, of the American Medical Association Association Pediatrics about potential unmet mental health needs of detained unaccompanied child migrants and an article in Forced Migration Review about rejected Central American asylum seekers of those fleeing gang-related violence. Working as a Fulbright Fellow with returned child and youth migrants from Mexico and the United States in El Salvador, she is currently assisting Salvadorans who are fleeing gang violence. Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Kennedy. Good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present and share initial results of the research that I've been doing in El Salvador with deported child migrants from Mexico and the United States. I'd also like to thank uh, the UC UCLA and the Hammer Forum, uh, especially Ian, Darren, and Claudia, who have helped me to get here, and also Hector and Antonio for sharing the stage tonight. So I look forward to answering your questions in the end. Um, and sharing this information with you as well. Before I begin, I should also thank a few people who made my research in El Salvador possible. Um, first and foremost, the children who have always agreed to talk to me after taking a 12 to 14 hour journey from Tapachula on a deportation bus uh, with their dreams often crushed. So I really appreciate them because without them, I wouldn't have anything to share with you tonight. At the same time, I do have a Salvadoran co-researcher. Her name is Carla Castillo. She has done about a third of the interviews for me. And then the, the, the Reacción General de Migración, so the Migration Agency in El Salvador, has made this research possible. Tonight, I'm going to share with you the results of research that I've been doing with the fastest growing group of migrants to the United States, which are unaccompanied child migrants. So these are children who arrive to the United States without a parent or legal guardian. Um, as Mexican migration and as adult migration has declined consistently over the past five years, their numbers have gone up. So from 2003 to 2011 in the United States, we received between five and 8,000 of these children each year. Then in 2012, that number went up to almost 14,000. In 2013, almost 24,000. And we've had over 30, uh, sorry, over 60,000 this year. At the same time, the number of Central American adults is increasing as the number of Mexican migrants decreases. Many of unaccompanied child migrants are from three countries in the Northern Triangle, from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And so if we want to understand the influx of adults and children coming from these areas, we must understand what is happening in these countries of origin. I've been working with unaccompanied child migrants in a service capacity and in a research capacity for over a decade. Since 2010, I have been researching this. And since October of 2013, I've been based in El Salvador and also spent a few days in Honduras and Guatemala on the ground working with researchers, government officials, service providers to child migrants. From January to September, so until last Tuesday, I have interviewed over 600 child migrants who were trying to reach the United States about why they were leaving, what they hoped to achieve, and what they would need to stay, essentially, in their home countries. And so that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight. I've been, worked for much longer with migrants. Um, and the first child migrant that I met, I was 16 and volunteering in an orphanage in Oaxaca, Mexico. And the young man, who was 12 years old at the time, told me he wanted to go north. And to me, it seemed, although he did not have a perfect life, he had an OK life. And I asked, why do you want to leave this? And he responded to me, porque quisiera ser alguien. I want to be someone. And that is something I've heard over and over again now. But it still raises the hairs on my arms, because I think ultimately that is what is the heart of, of every migrant's journey. They want to be someone who matters. And oftentimes in their home countries, they no longer feel like they do. And there are a number of reasons for this, and I'm going to discuss those first, and then I'm going to shift over to what I would like to say from a humanitarian and human rights perspective. Indeed, many of the children are migrating for family reunification. 35% have given me that reason. 
Now that is a very interesting number because over 90% have a family member here in the United States and over half have at least one of their parents. Many of them have US born siblings, cousins, and friends. And yet 35% are listing that reason. Many of them have been separated from their family members for over a decade. And as a former teacher, as a former caseworker, it is critical that children are able to be with their families. It is a basic human right, and our current immigration policies do not allow for this. At the same time, there are a large number who want to study. These are children who want to be doctors, engineers, nurses. Some of them, yes, they want to be mechanics. Some just want a job that's going to pay them a living wage that allows them to have the type of family they haven't had. 32% list this as a reason for their migration. At the same time, I would like to point out that there are significant concerns with pursuing one's education in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Honduras that I'm going to discuss further in just a few moments. Another 27% would like to seek work. These are all who told me that they want to find work are between the ages of 15 and 17. Most of them have been working since the age of 12, usually in agriculture, and they primarily come from three departments, from Ahuachapan, Cabañas, and Chalitenango. So these are youth who don't want to do anything new. They simply want to receive a living wage for the work that they have been doing. So oftentimes, they receive $100 a month. El Salvador is not a cheap place to live. $100 is not an easy income on which to live. So they would like to receive something that resembles a, a fair payment um, for their endeavors. And finally, there is a small group who simply wants to explore, who wants to travel, and wants to see other parts of the world, which is listed by 3%. So for me, these children, indeed, this does point to the need for us to have uh, a more expansive visa system. So many of them report that their family members here in the United States have temporary protected status or have work permits. Unfortunately, those types of visas do not entitle the adults to bring family to visit. It does not entitle them to go back and forth. And this is perhaps something that we should be thinking about in the United States that those people should be able to go back and forth and they should be able to bring their children um, to visit them. At the same time, we might want to consider having a separate visa for transnational families. Again, a child will excel if he or she feels part of a community and part of a family. And if he or she does not feel that, that is when we open ourselves up to lesser, <laughs> less, less ideal alternatives. At the same time, because so many of them do simply want to study and get a better education than their parents before them received, we need to make sure that their schools are safe. Oftentimes they are not. Um, several recent Libra release ports by UNICEF indicated that schools are some of the most unsafe places in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. At the same time, we should make sure that they are learning the things that they want to be learning, which is English, technical skills, and that they are able to travel. A final piece that it's often missing in the region is that there should be evidence-based economic and social development programs. Typically, United States investment in the region has centered on police and military initiatives. This is especially problematic because of the documented human rights abuses of both of these groups, which are growing, and because there is a complete lack of citizen confidence in these bodies. Um, one thing that I hear over and over again is that you cannot trust the police, that they could in fact be the same as the gangs or the cartels, that they, the walls have ears, and that you never know who is who. So of those who have been victims of crimes, which most of them have, they have not reported them. And to the extent that they have reported them, they were either not pursued or they ended up having to flee for their lives because of the greater risk they then faced. So again, for these issues, we do need immigration reform and we need it now. We don't need it yesterday. We needed it several decades ago because these are children who have needs now, their families have needs now, and they do contribute in a very positive way to our economy. Numerous reports have indicated that the overall benefit of migration is much more positive than the um, possible detriments. I do want to point out that the people who benefit from keeping our immigration policy antiquated and not appropriate for families are two who often do not get brought out in public. First would be the prison industrial complex. Private prisons are greatly benefiting from the 34,000 a day bed mandate for deportees or for those who are detained. They now make in the billions of dollars, whereas they used to be a very small industry in our country. At the same time, the military industrial complex benefits from us securing our border, running drones, what used to be blimps when it was in the 1990s. And this is concerning. These are two organizations who thrive on human suffering, and yet they are being able to lobby our politicians to do things that are not humanitarian, that do not put a human being first. 
At the same time, six, over 6,000 people have died since the securitization of our border. Um, that does mean that it, one person a day is dying, at least, as they try to make their way to a better life. So these are the things that typically get discussed when we talk about migration, and they are very important, and they are relevant to people migrating from all around the world. But what I want to speak to is what I've seen in El Salvador living there, and that, for whatever reason, has become heavily politicized, as it was in the 1970s and 1980s. And that is that there is a refugee crisis in Central America today, and I really hope that we will respond to it differently that than we did in the 1970s and 1980s when we ignored what was happening, when we ignored that people were fleeing for their lives and needed protection that they were not receiving. Yesterday, I took a flight, or I, I yeah, yesterday morning, I drove to the airport. I do live in San Salvador right now. And I had to leave at 5 a.m. The sun was rising. And it struck me what a beautiful country it is what a beautiful region it is. You know, the greens are greener than you will ever see. It has rolling hills, it has volcanoes, it's got the ocean in the background. It was the most beautiful sunset you would ever see. All the colors of the rainbow were in the sky. But at the same time, there's a fog that rolls in every morning. And it clears out and then it comes back, especially during this part of the six months of the year and it's going to rain. And it's funny because here in LA it doesn't rain at all and I actually missed <laughs> the rain <laughs> um, yesterday and today because I think it serves as, as, as a cleanser essentially because these are traumatized societies. Thousands were murdered and disappeared not long ago. Um, Civil War just ended in 1992 in El Salvador, in 1996 in Guatemala and in the midst of their Civil War recovery, the United States began deporting gang members who were trained here, who I would note many of them were unaccompanied child migrants that we chose not to treat for the trauma they had undergone, and we chose not to help assist transition into US society, although most who arrived excelled in our business owners today. Um, but what has come out in my interviews is that over 60% of these children are afraid for their lives. They feel that to stay, is to wait for their death. And so as far as what that looks like in their daily life, 145 of 322 children are living in a neighborhood with a gang present. And you might think to yourself, we have gangs here in the United States. We have gangs here in Los Angeles. I am a former teacher. I taught in inner city Atlanta. We had gangs. Several of my seventh grade students were beaten to the gangs. Yeah, we have gangs. This is true. <laughs> the gangs that are in Central America started here, in fact. But we also have a protection system. Um, and as flawed as it may be, as unhappy as we may be with the police, there is someone you can turn to. And yes, there is a culture of silence in the, some communities, but at the end of the day, you can decide to move. For these children, a number of them have tried moving and they were still pursued by the gang. More troubling is that for those who live in what's known as a zona roja, a contested zone, they are afraid to cross the street, they're afraid to go more than three or four blocks from their home, and that is about half of those 145. Four of them have had psychological breakdowns and have been checked into the ER, and the doctors instructed their parents to get them out of the country as soon as they could. 130 of these children are studying in schools that have a gang presence nearby, usually in the park that is across the street, or at the entrance at start and end times. A hundred of them are studying in schools that have a gang presence inside. That means that there is a large presence of arms, of knives, of drugs, and in exceptional cases, the school directors and the teachers are actively involved in forcible recruitment. Seventy of those children have quit studying because they are afraid to be in one of the places that should be the safest for children. That is something that will have lifelong comp uh, consequences for them individually, for their families, for their communities, for the nation, and for our region as a whole. Another 109 have been directly threatened. They received threats to either join the gang or be killed. 22 of them were assaulted when they refused, some of them on multiple occasions. And another 14 have had a parent murdered. Perhaps the saddest piece of this is, in fact, the social contract that is completely broken. As I mentioned, these are traumatized societies. Most of them have not recovered from what they endured. And for that reason, it's speculated that there are higher rates of domestic abuse, uh, interfamilial violence, and the societal violence that we see in such high levels today. So that is something that needs to be addressed that was not ever addressed. The fact that very much the, the contract needs to be repaired, and that's something that will take years, not months. 
The fact that many of these children do not go outside their homes, they have made themselves prisoners in their own homes, they don't go outside during the day or during the night, those who are religious have stopped attending church, they have no quality of life. And so in this regard, when I said that only 35% are listing family reunification as a reason for their migration, I do ask then why now? Why have you decided to reunify now? And the adolescents, which make up 80% of my study participants, have explained to me in a very logical manner that their risk of staying in El Salvador will remain very high, if not increased, through their late 20s. They reference the fact that 10 to 13 people a day are dying. This is a country of 6.2 million people. The rate is even higher for Honduras, where 18 a day are dying in a country of 8 million people. And then they say that their risk of going on the journey are going down as they become more emotionally and physically mature. It is a misperception among U.S. government officials that they do not understand the risk of this journey. They are very well aware that they could be raped, they could be murdered, they could be maimed, they could be forcibly, um, they could be forced into labor that they do not want to do. And yet they decide that the risk is a lesser one because it may end with some type of hope. And so in this regard, it is not immigration reform that's needed to address this, it is a humanitarian response. I do think we need immigration reform because, like I said, kids migrate for multiple reasons. But at the same time, we need to be thinking about how we can immediately protect those who do not have protection in their countries because asylum grant rates for Salvadorans, Guatemalans, and Honduras are abysmal. They are between 2 and 6%. And at the same time, we need to, again, be thinking about economic and social development in the country rather than these police and military solutions that have failed time and time again. And then finally, we should be thinking about things like in-country processing so that they do not have to endure a dangerous journey and they can instead travel safely for a much cheaper rate. And with this, I will leave you, but I really hope to answer some of your questions based upon the time that I have been living, uh, living there now. Um, and thank you for listening to me as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hector Barreto is chairman of the Latino Coalition, a group whose stature in the business community has grown steadily since Barreto took the helm of the organization in 2006. The Latino Coalition is now considered one of the leading and largest Latino advocacy groups in the nation. A nationally recognized business leader, Barreto served five years as the administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration, and he currently serves as a member of the board of the United States Chamber of Commerce and sits on its Council for Small Business. He was honored in 2006 by President Fox of Mexico with the prestigious Aguilla Azteca Award, which is bestowed for significant contributions to Mexico from a citizen of another country. Hector Beretta was the author of The Engine of America, a book dedicated to motivating and inspiring entrepreneurs through real life stories and the winning formulas of successful business leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, Hector Barreto. Thank you, Ian, and thank all of you for being here tonight. We appreciate you spending your most valuable asset, your time with us. And uh, I also want to uh, thank the organizers of this event and also my uh, uh, colleagues who were with me uh, tonight. Elizabeth, thank you for your presentation, and Antonio Gonzalez, a dear friend of mine. Um, I thought that was a very compelling presentation that Elizabeth made. I want to take the issue from a different perspective, obviously because of uh, some of the background that Ian talked about. Uh, you know, for me, immigration reform is very personal. It's a very personal issue to me. You know, a lot of times when we talk about this issue, uh, you know, if we don't have an, a, a direct connection to it or direct involvement, it's very, you know, conceptual. But for me, it was just, you know, part of my life. My father, Hector Barreto Sr., was an immigrant uh, to the United States uh, in the 1950s and he moved to Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, and that's where I was born. That's not uh, you know, a hotbed of Hispanic culture in the middle of the country. But I talk about the fact that my father's story, he used to call it his sueño americano, his American dream, is something that we've seen millions and millions of times over. I, I'm sure that many of you have similar examples. My father, um, grew up, he was born in Mexico, uh, he immigrated in the 1950s, but it wasn't because he wanted to and he wasn't really in danger. He needed an opportunity. He ran into some hard times 
and he had some relatives uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. There were jobs there in the 1950s, and, and he went there. My father was a very proud man. Uh, he was a very hard worker. He was a visionary. Uh, he he didn't expect anybody to give him anything. He didn't. Uh, he he basically felt, you know, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to work hard. All I want is an opportunity. My mother's family was also from Mexico, but she was actually born in Kansas City, Missouri. She's second generation uh, Mexican uh, American. Uh, my father worked very hard. I remember. Uh, he used to tell me these stories. His first jobs were picking potatoes for 50 cents an hour in rural Missouri. Uh, he worked his way up to working on the railroad, uh, pounding spikes into the ground. There was a lot of railroads in the Midwest. Uh, but it, when the winter, it got very cold, so he wanted to work inside. So he ended up um, uh, getting a job in a meat packing plant. It was very difficult work, hard work, dirty work, cleaning out the stalls. But at least he was a little bit warmer. Uh, later on, he became the janitor in the school that I would eventually go to. And I remember my father always talking about himself as a businessman. And I would say, Dad, you're not a businessman. You're the janitor at my school. And my father would say, no, 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 no. That's what I have to do right now. But that's not who I am. This is a means to an end. I'm a businessman. And true to form, he was. He saved his money in, in and my mom. Uh, opened up one of the first Mexican restaurants in Kansas City, Missouri. I waited tables in that restaurant when I was nine years old. Uh, and, and for us, you know, working hard was not an option. My, my mother and father would say to us, that was just survival. One restaurant led to two restaurants. You know, people in Kansas City didn't know what an enchilada or a taco was. They thought it was very exotic food. Two turned into three. Later on, my father's customers wanted to make this food at home, so they, he started a little import-export company to bring stuff back from Mexico to sell to his customers. He had all these little buildings. He started a little construction company. None of these businesses were big. None of them were that successful, but they were critically important to my family. My father was also a natural leader, and I remember when he, he, you know, he, he was talking to some other businessmen in Kansas City. By the way, there was a small Hispanic population there, and he said, I want to join the local Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And they said, well, there is no local Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And my dad said, well, that's not right. So he started one in Kansas City, Missouri. And later on, he said, I want to join a national Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And they said, there is definitely no national Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And my father said, well, there should be. So he started one. He started the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. In those days, people would say, why do you even need to do this? There's not that many Hispanic businesses. And my father said, but there will be. And he was right. He was prescient. Uh, today, Hispanic businesses are the fastest growing segment of the economy. There's three million Hispanic businesses. They generate $500 billion in revenue every single year. They're all across the country. Those numbers will double every five years, so there'll be 12 million Hispanic businesses. By the way, we're right in ground zero. A third of all Hispanic businesses are in California. A fourth are in Southern California. So those were some of my lessons. So when you know when people say, you know, what do immigrants contribute to this country? I'm a product of an immigrant, and I know what they contribute to this country. They built this country. I've had a lot of experiences in my life. You know, I worked in those family businesses. I got to go to college because of my father and mother's hard work. I worked for a large corporation. I moved here in the late 1980s to start my own business. Uh, I didn't know anybody in California, so my father said, join uh, the local chamber, Hispanic chamber, and I did, and I worked my way up there. Uh, that's where I ended up meeting the governor. My father introduced me to the governor of Texas. I didn't even know who it was. My father was not politically involved. My father had been. His organization, U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, worked with Ronald Reagan, worked with the first President Bush. So my father introduced me to the governor of Texas. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was going to run for president, and he asked me to join his campaign, and I did. And after that, he asked me to go back to Washington to run the Small Business Administration. And that was an incredible experience. I've come back now, and I have my own businesses. And as Ian said, I, I run uh, an organization that also helps Hispanic businesses called the Latino Coalition. Just very quickly, I, I want to talk about a couple of things, and I know we're going to get into questions here. 
I serve on the board of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce now, and that's the number one legislative priority for the U.S. Chamber. And I would not say the U.S. Chamber is a real liberal organization. It is a conservative organization that worked with AFL-CIO to come together on a, a comprehensive immigration reform, and obviously we haven't seen it yet. There is this uh, perception out there, Republicans don't want reform. Well, I mean, a, a Republican named Marco Rubio helped negotiate the Senate package. Of course, he worked with a Democrat named Bob Menendez, uh, who, who came up with those, the original package, that, that gang of six. There are other uh, Republicans named Brian Sandoval, the governor of Nevada, Susana Martinez, the governor of New Mexico, Mario diaz Balart, and, and many others. There are millions of Latinos that vote for the Republican Party. So it can't be that Republicans uh, don't want immigration reform. They want. But they want immigration reform, but they approach it from a different place. Uh, I always say, you know, I, I don't demonize people that disagree with me or my ideas. I, you know, I stipulate, I believe that we all want the same things. We may just have different ways about how getting there. All Latinos, by the way, don't feel the same way. Antonio will talk about that. Uh, Antonio is a dear friend. Uh, you know, you have Latinos that are on border states that say, yeah, we need to do something about our border. We need to have a common sense immigration package. And both sides have let us down. And, and, I, and I think there's some truth to that. Uh, I think both parties are at fault. Now, there are many opportunities, and there's been some progress. But, you know, some people in elected office, this may surprise you, uh, they don't want solutions on both sides. They want the issue. They benefit from the issue. And, and they don't pay any price for it either. And so that's part of the problem. Um, I will tell you that Republicans are very sensitive to this issue because they know that they'll never win another presidential election if they don't do something on immigration reform. And by the way, immigration reform is not one of the top issues in the Hispanic community. Why? Because 90% of Hispanics have no problem with their status here. The number one issues in the Latino community is the economy, education, and health care, and they feel that both parties have let them down on that. So there needs to be some progress there. Look, the last president to get immigration reform was a Republican president named Reagan from California. That was 1986. The next president to try to do immigration reform in a serious way was my old boss, Bush, in 2006. And we can talk about what some of the problems that they had, uh, and especially Bush, from both parties. His own party didn't support him, but he wasn't getting a lot of support from the Democratic Party either. Um, you've got leaders like Jeb Bush who wrote a book about immigration reform. I think the key thing is nobody is going to get everything that they want. We really need to approach this from a middle ground perspective. Uh, now, a Antonio and I sometimes have this discussion. There are some people, like the chamber, who say that we need a big package. Because if you don't get a big package, you're not going to get this done. There are other voices, and I don't disagree with this, that say, you know what? We're not going to get a big package. We need to uh, cut this off in slices. Antonio will talk about how this may be our version of the civil rights movement. Civil rights didn't happen in one big package. It happened over a decade, four different packages. Look, I don't think it's a question of if. Immigration reform will happen. And the other thing that I say is this is not a Latino issue. It's an American issue. This is critically important to the future of this country, both from an economic perspective and a securities perspective. Look, it's immigrants. I, I, I marvel. You know, we're still a young country, you know, in a, in a lot of ways. You know, Scotland's talking about breaking away. They've been together for 300 years. We're, we're you know, we're still 240 plus years into this, and we forget how this country was started. It was started by immigrants, how it was built, how it was conquered, the contributions that are made were made by immigrants, and yet we forget about the benefits of, of immigrants. And so we, we need to remind people of that. There's a lot of stats on this. I'll just close with, I, I, I remember, uh, especially at times like this, something that Winston Churchill said one time, and I'm gonna paraphrase, because this isn't an, an exact quote. You know, America will try many things that don't work, but eventually, they always do the right thing. And that's what I think is going to happen on immigration. So I'm optimistic. I don't think it's a question of if, it's just when. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hector. 
Antonio Gonzalez is president of the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project that was founded in 1974 and is the largest and oldest nonpartisan Latino voter participation organization in the U.S. Antonio and the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project have been central figures in the dramatic growth of Latino political participation across the nation. During Gonzalez's tenure, the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project has nearly tripled Latino registration from 5.4 million in 1994 to more than 14 million registrants in 2012. He currently appears as a regular commentator on the Public Radio International Tavis Smiley Show and hosts his own weekly radio show here at KPFK in Los Angeles on Mondays at 4 p.m. called Strategy Session. Time magazine named Gonzalez one of the 25 most influential Hispanics in America. Ladies and gentlemen, Antonio Gonzalez. Uh, I too want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues for uh, uh, their excellent presentations uh, tonight and thank Ian for um, talking me into this. Ian and I uh, share uh, offices sometime at KPFK. We're both a lot better dressed tonight uh, than we are usually uh, on the uh, at the radio show because we both have uh, faces that are made for radio. <laughs> I want to tell you uh, um, I've, been, I've been asked, ironically, to make the democratic case for immigration reform, which I will grudgingly do, uh, and then um, tell you what I think the uh, moment is. I think we're in a very particular moment in what is uh, a marathon uh, that hopefully will end up in some justice for immigrants sometime soon. But I'll start off, as all professional toastmakers do, with a story uh, that I think characterizes immigration reform. The first thing I think you should understand is that what you understand about immigration reform is probably wrong. Uh, and I think that's probably true for most Americans. In the last immigration reform, um, drama that was successfully cl concluded in 1986 that was a preparatory uh, leading up to that, the amnesty of, 80, uh, of 1986 by President Reagan in partnership with the Democratic Congress was sort of successfully shepherded through at that time by uh, Hispanic national organizations and um, a whole group of bipartisan legislators. And I remember back in those days, there was a famous meeting, Hector's dad was probably there, of national Hispanic leaders. And the issue of immigration uh, was not as mature in Latino community leadership as it is now. Uh, there was a gathering of leaders, and there's a pretty well-known Latino consultant who at that time was the head of LULAC, a guy named Arnold Torres, who's now a consultant in Sacramento, political consultant in Sacramento. And he arranged this gathering. You know, Cesar Chavez was there, and Hector's dad, and Willie Velasquez, sort of the icons of the day. And nobody knew that much about immigration reform except they knew it was important and we were committed to it. It was, it was not a, a, you know, a, a historic issue for the Latino community, civil rights movement in that sense, but it was an emerging issue. And Arnold Torres says to this gathering of national leaders, now I know that a lot of you are probably confused about immigration reform. Okay, and so they went through the three-hour briefing and charts and speeches and these, you know, leaders, you know, at certain points had their eyes crossed and it was complicated push factors and pull factors and labor market issues and et cetera. And at the end of the day, they were exhausted. They had lunch and they, and, and they had a, the final 
uh, uh, session, and, and Arnold gets up and he says, now I know you were confused at the beginning of this briefing about immigration reform. It's a complex issue. And everybody nodded, yes, we were confused. And then he says, and now I know that you're still confused about immigration reform. And everybody nods, yes, we're still confused. And he said, but think of it this way. You're now confused at a much higher level. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions about immigration reform. There's really three um, legs to the immigration reform stool, let's say, over this last period. The first is an understanding that, and maybe pe people, and I'm giving you the democratic spiel here, is that um, there is a shortage over 25 years of labor in America. Census Bureau says we're 25 million workers short. Now, that's hard to conceptualize given the rough economy that we've had, but it's a general truth that over the next 25 years, we're going to be short millions of workers uh, if we want to grow the economy at an average 2 to 3% rate per year if we want to have the kind of prosperity in America that we think we should have. Therefore, America needs immigrant labor, legal immigrant labor in the right location at the right time, et cetera, but needs it. Therefore, you have to fix what is the broken migration system. We have a migration system. <clears throat> it creates undocumented illegal migration because it's uh, uh, capped with quotas by countries. If you want to migrate legally, legally from Mexico, forget about it. You're talking about you know, a dozen year wait or more. So that's the first problem with our system. It doesn't supply in an aging country, right? Middle class countries tend to age. Same problem in Europe, Japan, aging workers, aging workforce, not replacing itself because it's middle class. So you need migrant labor. That's one problem that has to be fixed. <clears throat> A second problem that has to be fixed is that you have uh, uh, now more than 10 million persons that have lived in the United States without documents for a long time. They're not recent immigrants, some 20 years, some 10 years, and they don't have basic human and social rights, right? They can't be productive members of society without legal status. So you have to address that issue. That's the legalization, the amnesty issue, from the point of view of human rights. Uh, it's a sort of a moral issue as well. You can't have a healthy democracy that's two-tiered. So that's your second motivation. And your third leg to the triangle is uh, you can't have uh, uh, insecurity. All nations have the right to control their borders, quote, unquote. I'm not a believer in that philosophy, by the way, but that's the argument. You have to have border security. We had uh, you know, September 11th, and this was a particularly a vexing problem that really changed the mix of immigration reform was the attacks in 2001. But you have to have security. The country has to have legal migration status, therefore you have to close the undocumented routes. Border security. That's the case for immigration reform. And that's the reason why uh, those three uh, uh, legs, if you will, were put together uh, to create uh, what, what is called comprehensive immigration reform. <clears throat> now, that being said, let me tell you that I think this moment that we're in is the moment of truth. Because in, in politics, in life, in elections, one has to have a theory of, a theory. What's your theory of change? What's your theory of the election? What's your theory of the legislation? And uh, uh, you, we're next to UCLA. You know that you have to test your theory. And we've now had a 13-year, 14-year test of this theory of you put these three legs together and you meet in the center 
and you compromise and you have a comprehensive you, uh, you know solution that everybody agrees to at the end of the day it's tough you you know you uh, uh, haggle and you come out with a bill and that has been a catastrophic failure so i would argue that we're in this moment where it's time to shift paradigms we need a new theory because the old theory failed can't, I can't be any more open and honest than that. The notion of putting these three issues together and to create successful legislation that could be implemented to fix the immigration problem failed. And it's good, you know, I don't want to be too long because I want to hear your questions and, and get into a dynamic uh, dialogue. But I think that's the conversation that we have to have, which is what is the new, what is the new paradigm? Uh, and uh, I have a bias. I think that theory of change, the theory of legislation, was wrong from the beginning. I think that um, we have, in fact, had a unbalanced, in practice, immigration reform for some time, because the notion of security has been implemented in the out in the outside outside of any le uh, legislative package. Every year, we have ratcheted up enforcement partly because of the response to September 11th and partly because uh, of response from uh, 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 protectionist and restrictionist forces that have had hegemony in both parties in Congress. Uh, security along the border is dramatically increased. Militarization along the border is dramatically increased. Uh, enforcement by both President Bush and uh, President Obama in the, in the form of massive deportations has gone up and up and up and up and up. And so I think we have had, this is one leg of the immigration reform stool, but we cling to this notion uh, that we should have this package that is part security, part legalization, and part new migration. And I think it's collapsed uh, for a lot of reasons uh, on itself. I advocate a um, incremental approach. In fact, I think Hector and others would agree with me that are in the know that we could have already had uh, some legalization if we would have uh, shed the notion of the one package, one time deal uh, for years. We could have had a legalization of the dreamers, a permanent legalization instead of a temporary one. Uh, we could have had legalization in other sectors of the economy. Those deals were on the table and rejected in Congress because of this uh, notion of one package, one time. Uh, like, as Hector said, we had with the Civil Rights Movement. There's a misremembering of history, uh, uh, I think. Uh, people think that uh, civil rights was enacted in one fell swoop, and it was not. The 1964 bill was only public accommodations. There was a bill in 1965 which was voting rights f essentially for African Americans. There was a bill in 68 and 72 uh, uh, protecting civil rights and uh, non-discrimination in employment and in housing. And in 1975 there was another civil rights uh, bill for uh, non-English speaking minorities. So it was an 11 year haul of five different bills. And in my view, that is a more likely scenario for immigration reform. I wish we could have an immigration reform that is just and fair and one fell swoop and overarching comprehensive bill. But the practice has shown us uh, that it's not doable. One, and two, if you had the bill that uh, some people uh, support, you would not be happy with it. The bill that was passed in the Senate is an essentially a declaration of war on Mexico with a massive militarization on the border. It would not have legalized not even half of the undocumented and would have been an authorization of massive deportations. And I could go on and on. So uh, let me stop there. I'm very anxious to uh, hear your questions and comments. And uh, let's get on with the show, Ian. Well, let me get on with the show with you, uh, Antonio, because I, I'm, I'm. When you talk about a new paradigm, is it possible, and it may be fanciful, but is it possible to to have a kind of European EU model 
where you have much more mobility, you have much more legal immigration. So if you have an enormous amount of legal immigration, people coming back and forth, uh, repatriating <coughs> money, not necessarily living all their time in, 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 both, in one, of the, one or both of the countries. If you had enhanced legal immigration like they have in the EU, for example, and mobility, that would mean that the only people crossing the border would be criminals. So you would actually have a reason to have border security because the only people that would be not using the legal system would be people that you should be watching. So is there any possibility that we could have a paradigm shift in, along those lines? Um, well, of course. Uh, uh, the collapse of this paradigm, uh, I think, if advocates uh, started developing a new paradigm, you could have new ideas. That uh, I've heard that um, talked about as a uh, the establishment of a North American visa. That's that's sort of out there in the literature. Right. But uh, sequentially, I think uh, the new paradigm might look like this. We've had a lot of enforcement. We don't need more. The Central American children's crisis is not a case for the borders out of control. It's a case for the borders in control because these children turned themselves willingly into the uh, uh, border police. If you go down to the border, there's the border police, they play dominoes because they don't have anything to do because there's not enough immigrants crossing the border illegally. They, they, there's actually a tremendous un, uh, unproductiveness in, in the border police because there's 20,000 of them. They have drones, they have radar, they have, they got it, they got the tremendous infrastructure and it's only getting more. So the border's not out of control, it's in control. And I don't think we need more. We, we're deporting 1,100 million, 1,100 people per day. We don't need to do more of that. I think in sequentially, if you had the politics, the next piece is uh, sort of humanitarian family unification and legalization of as many uh, peer persons that, as you can get through. The, uh, and I think the hard part, the hardest part, is new, a new migration. It's just hard. It's America. We have a xenophobic wing. We're in a bad job recovery it's, it's the hardest one, but I think we're all talking about this within a five-year continuum. Because as um, uh, f uh, sort of pro-immigrant forces that sort of Hector represents, business forces, common sense forces in the Republican Party continue to uh, 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 have their interests hurt by sort of workforce problems and instability problems, you know, at the end of the day, and you have sort of pro-immigrant forces from this, uh, not just Latinos, but Asians and others that are uh, flowing into both parties, you do create a new uh, sort of conventional wisdom across both parties, but not like in 2014, not in 2016. You know, maybe by 2018, 20, you begin to see critical mass for those forces. Uh, but you can get some things, uh, again, uh, we could have had bills already in 2006 and 2008. There were the votes there to get uh, partial legalizations through. So I think sequentially that's sort of the next one up. Uh, uh, but again, we're, I'm not speaking of a short-term deal. I think, uh, you know, the president did us a disservice when he succumbed to uh, uh, politics, and that really hurt we were talking, we were looking at $5 million in a temporary legalization program. Uh, that was the skinny that he was going to promulgate through an executive order. He says now he's going to do it after the election. We don't believe him anymore. And the skinny from Washington is that uh, that's being killed as we speak. That hurt. It hurt. It was a very important setback. But, but again, we're in a dynamic politics. We're in a dynamic politics. The for, the, 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 at, the at the ground level... The constituency for um, uh, legalization and immigration reform in the electorate is growing. It's growing. It's growing. Uh, so I think that's my 
Well, let me ask you the same question. Uh, is there a new paradigm possible? Do you have one up your sleeve? I wish I had one up my sleeve. You know, this is the, the proverbial debate. Look, I agree with most everything that Antonio said, but I also, you know, uh, one of the things that he did say is that it's a, it's a changing and shifting environment because the political environment in 1986 was very different than it is in 2006, which is very different than it's going to be in 2016. You know, Bush wanted to get immigration reform, but one of the things that he says now is he made a huge mistake, and the mistake was and right after he got uh, reelected, instead of doing immigration reform right away, he got talked into doing uh, Social Security reform. We spent a year on Social Security reform, and they kept doubling down, doubling down. And then you had Hurricane Katrina, and then you know the, the bottom fell out right. on the administration. He had no support, not only in his party, but the other party saw him as weak as well. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you need leadership. You know, one of the problems that, that also I think a lot of Latinos have is, you know, I was saying this on a radio interview, you know, they feel like it's Lucy and the football, you know, and they're, they're Charlie Brown, and, they're, you know, the football gets moved all the time, and they fall flat on their face. You know, it was Obama, when he was running for president, that said, this will be my number one priority in year one. Why? It wasn't because... He all of a sudden became a convert on immigration. When he was in the Senate, he was against some of the things that Bush was trying to do on immigration. It was because he was running against Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton said, I'll do it in my first term. And Obama won up her. And he said, I'll do it in my first year. Well, guess what? He didn't do it in his first year. He didn't do it in his second year. And he controlled everything then. He didn't need any Republican votes. That's right. He could have done anything that he wanted to. And he didn't do it. So... There, some of this is the environment that we live in, and some of it is also the leadership. You know, one of the things that, you know, and again, there could be difference of opinions on this, but, you know, people on my side of the aisle say, if you're really serious about legislation, before you talk about it, you're going to line up your support. You're going to think out what the, what the policy is going to be. You're going to prepare for the attacks that you're going to get on the other side. You're going to create a bipartisan approach to it. But, but that's not what we hear now. You know, somebody goes out and gives a speech. Somebody goes out and makes a promise. But none of this legwork is done. And so it never happens. And so um, now, the, the other area that I you know, slightly disagree with Antonio, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but if you start chopping it up into little pieces. By the way, Antonio and I do agree, and that is, Whatever way it can happen, we're for that. You know, If it can happen over uh, a period of time in separate bills, we're for that. If there's an opening for us to do a big bill, you know, we're for that. Whatever it is going to get us over the finish line. But what people in the business community will say is you're never going to be able to get the, the support that you need if you start chopping this up into little pieces. Because as soon as one constituency is satisfied, they're gone from the issue. They don't care what your issue is. They already got paid. They're, they got taken care of, and they're down the line. So, you know, that, that's the argument for, look, we're going to have to, you know, uh, go through some tough sledding in order to be able to get this. Because, you know, what happens usually, I think, in, in, in Washington, D.C., when there's ever there's any progress is nobody's totally happy. You know, you got something, but you didn't get what you thought you were going to get. But at least you moved the ball forward. And, and that's where I think that we're going to have to get to. So any quick thoughts, Elizabeth, any magical uh, potions you have here? Well, I would say that the reason that an open border policy works in the EU is because the other nations are on board with it. Um, there is a huge power imbalance between El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, and other Central American nations. I do think it would be possible to have open borders, but I think that those nations would have to work together. And there is a large amount of division and discrimination amongst the different nations. So I think if they would uh, present a united front, present a united voice and say, hey, listen, United States, you need to be giving our citizens who benefit your economy more rights than they currently have, <coughs> it would happen quite quickly. But right now, which I've been in the front seat to, there's a great fear of offending the United States government, no longer getting the money that you get for the different types of packages that you want to receive. And so they don't necessarily represent their citizens who live in the exterior as well as they should. Let's get questions here. We have uh, microphones on both sides. Um, anybody has, uh, has a question? Just raise your hand and uh, um, surely somebody has a question here. 
Yes, the lady here in front. How can we as a country make immigration, I know this is about immigration reform in the US, but how can we make immigration less um, needed for the people in, uh, in Latin America that we're talking about? I mean, what um, responsibility do we have as a nation to those countries that we, in essence, um, sort of help to destabilize and create the current problem that we have now. And you know, this is going back to the 50s mm -hmm. and maybe before. But um, so what, what can we do or what would you advocate as um, a nation to, to help people not ha have a necessity to come here in the first place? Elizabeth, that's, I think, to you. That's an excellent question. And one thing I would point out is most of the kids I interview do tell me they never wanted to come to the United States. I think we in the United States like to think that everyone wants to live here. Uh, when, in fact, kids want to be where they've grown up. They want to be with their families. They want to be in the place that they call home. And like I said, these are beautiful places to live. And so I think that has to be a question. How do we allow people to benefit from their right to stay? Because as human beings, we have both a right to stay and a right to migrate, to move freely. Right now, yes, the problem is that U.S. involvement in the region has been incredibly problematic and continues to be problematic. Um, we invest far too much in military and police solutions, which is the same approach that we take here in the United States, and it doesn't work any better here for poor communities. So I would first and foremost say that we might actually give genuine economic and social development a try. Um, one thing that's come out a lot is that there aren't a whole lot of kids migrating from Nicaragua. And one of the questions, and I'm no expert in Nicaragua, um, supposedly I'm an expert in the Northern Triangle countries, which is arguable, but you know, one of the things that always comes up is why aren't the kids leaving Nicaragua? Well, Nicaragua did not get money from the United States government. They were allowed to develop in the way that they would like. They did several things that the U.S. government would not have supported, one being a rehabilitative criminal justice system, another being community policing, a third being when a child committed a crime that they were instead matched up with a mentor. Um, and so they don't have the same problems with gangs, with violence. Uh, I think Nicaragua is the second safest country in all of Latin America, whereas El Salvador and Honduras are the two most dangerous countries. So there needs to be a very honest discussion of the type of money and investment and priorities that the United States has had in the region and genuinely shifting to a different focus, one that we perhaps don't even have in our own country. Um, but at the same time, when kids are fleeing for their lives, so I, I have spoken to USAID, to the US Embassy, to US consular officials in El Salvador, and <laughs> the ICE representative was there, as was the Department of Justice representative, as was someone from Department of Homeland Security, and they believe to give these children protection is to invite people to flood into our country, and I don't think that is accurate. As long as they are not being protected there is an international legal system that exists for those children to get protection. And it's not just children, it is adults as well. So yes, in the long term, we need to be thinking about economic and social development. We need to think about repairing a broken social contract, but immediately we need to be providing protection. You want to follow up or should we get another question? Go ahead. The gentleman up there in the red T-shirt on the left, you put your hand up, you still want to? Yeah, well, I, the question is actually quite similar, but it was it was mostly about like you, you mentioned that economic and social development that you'd like to see you know funding shifted towards towards that in in the region. And I was wondering if if you knew of examples of kinds of like direct spending that the United States could do because there's a lot of evidence in very dangerous places in in Mexico that like unconditional cash transfers to households do wonders in terms of increasing like child nutrition. It, the long, longer they stay in school, and it's a really hands off project. You just give families a bunch of money each year, and that's it. And it's shown to increase a bunch of things. Uh, I wonder if you heard about this in, in that area, uh, possible applications like that, or different kinds of spending. Anybody want to take that on? Well, I, what you're saying is true. There's a lot of examples of rich countries uh, essentially building the infrastructure of poor countries most notably the EU, 
where uh, Western European uh, and Northern European countries funded billions of dollars of development in Spain, Portugal, the sort of the Southern Rim countries, and raised their... By doing that, you raise their uh, worker productivity, raise the educational level, and by doing that, they raise their ability to... Uh, their con uh, consumptive ability. And that's what sort of facilitated the open borders policy because people migrated for other reasons outside of desperation. Uh, you, you also see uh, those kinds of cash transfer, po poverty reduction, uh, not so much in, uh, in uh, the U.S. sort of sphere of interest countries, but in South America, where you have, um, uh, the, you know, your, your open borders may happen in South America before it happens in North America, because there is a convergence of sort of left countries, and they're doing a lot of poverty reduction uh, uh, Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina, et cetera, uh, with, with salutary uh, results. The, the problem is reaching an, an equilibrium, and that equilibrium is um, policy, American policies that help sustainable development in the immigrant-sending countries, which are really Mexico, uh, uh, Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, the DR in the Caribbean. Those are really the, the migrant-sending countries. South America doesn't have a lot of migration to the United States, although in some places it's growing. But the numbers are small. And we have had um, a really mixed experience uh, with U.S. efforts. What are the U.S. efforts? NAFTA and CAFTA. And, uh, uh, and I'm certain there's a lot, of, a lot of things to say about both of those. But they haven't resulted. They have resulted in investment into those countries, and some middle class development. But they've also resulted in displacement, a lot of migration related uh, 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 to U.S. You know, in, in in trade, there's winners and losers, and there's been losers in particular Mexico's rural sector, which has generated a lot of the migration, uh, and that's from U.S. trade penetration. Uh, so we don't have a, 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 a we don't have a model where the U.S., a successful model, from the point of view of reducing out-migration through U.S.-stimulated development. We don't have one. That's another sort of conversation that we have to have in the United States. And NAFTA and CAFTA are sort of out of vogue right now, but they were in vogue for a while. But that's only one side of it. The other side of it, I, I, I repeat, is the, over, over the next 20 years, the United States does not have a sufficiently growing workforce to meet its growth needs. So it's not so much reducing the need for migration, it's calibrating the relationship so that there's sustainable development in immigrant sending countries and there's a, uh, a fair and equitable in-migration policy uh, to supply the labor shortage. There's a labor surplus in certain Latin American countries in certain countries of the world, and there's a labor shortage, structural shortage in the United States, and you have to make those mesh. Some more questions? I have the gentleman over there on the right. <coughs> Hi. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong and also answer my question. Um, one of the things that um, I see that I notice with um, all your points um, is the, the United States' um, lack of diplomacy with Latin America, especially the three countries, um, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. How can we get, uh, or how can we implement diplomacy? Because, like you say, when we, when we do it in business, it's through CAFTA or NAFTA, which um, you know, causes, um, it just stabilizes the business community and causes environmental degradation. And then when we try to come in and um, supposedly help the government, help the governments, um, it's done negatively. Like um, with the wars in El Salvador, the wars in the civil wars in El Salvador, civil wars in Guatemala, and also in Honduras, uh, which we, we were partly responsible for um, getting rid of the last president. And then um, education, we seem to do, we don't seem to support them at all. And then the two countries that, in Central America, that don't have serious problems, like um, Nicaragua and Costa Rica, for example, Costa Rica doesn't really have, um, they don't have a military, 
and they don't have um, so they don't really have much of a foundation for a despot to come in. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Nicaraguan government, um, they find after, after all uh, the United States attempts to ruin that country, I mean the U.S. I mean good for Nicaragua, they don't. Uh, I guess our involvement there is minimal, so they've been allowed to develop. So um, just diplomacy in every every way imagine, imaginable, business, education. Um, well, let, let's have, let's have uh, thank you. Hector answer that question. You no, know, uh, it's a it's a good question, and 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 I'm I'm not sure if, if we have enough time or lifetimes to to try to to solve it all. I was in, in uh, Mexico City a couple of weeks ago with a governor. I helped him uh, with his trade mission, and he said something that I hadn't heard another politician or elected official said say. And what he said is, "We live in a great neighborhood, all of us. We live in a great neighborhood." I never heard anybody say it that way. And what he was talking about was not the United States. He was talking about North America, Central America, South America, the Americas. He said, "You know, you look around the world right now, and you see." all the problems that are going on. Pick, pick a part of the world, you know, the Middle East, uh, the Ukraine, uh, Asia. You, you, and he said, but we share so much in common. You know, we have these mutual histories. We have these mutual interests. We have, by and large, not all, but stable governments. We have a, a, a lot of freedom in our countries that these other countries don't have. A lot of times we have common faith common principles, common value systems. Now, having said all of that, doesn't mean that we all understand each other. I remember a, a U.S. ambassador, uh, uh, Jeffrey Davidoff, wrote a book called The Bear and the Porcupine, and it was his description of the United States and Latin America. And guess who was the bear? The United States, this big lumbering animal that usually steps on the, the poor porcupine because he doesn't see it or doesn't care about it. The porcupine is always on the defensive, always paranoid, thinks that the, that the big bear is going to do something to it. And he, he used that as a kind of a description of the United States and Latin America. Last thing I'll say on that is that one of the things that, you know, I hear different leaders, and it's a, maybe it seems like a radical idea, even coming from a conservative, is that we need a, a new plan. We need a Marshall Plan for Latin America. You know, after World War II, we helped build up our enemies, and now they're their, our closest friends, our closest trading partners, you know, Germany, Japan. Uh, why can't we do that for Latin America? Why, why can't we do that? It's in our best interest to do that. Now, when you talk about diplomacy, uh, uh, you know, again, that means different things to different people. And at the end of the day, a lot of our leaders, and this is not just currently, but are always only interested and what is in it for us? What is our self-interest? We could care less what happens in, in the rest of the world. Well, that has to change because the world is a much more complicated place now. It's a much more dangerous place. And because we live in this great neighborhood, we should be good neighbors. And Tony wants to follow up. And, we, and so, does, so does Elizabeth. You know, <clears throat> I watched the... Uh, MSNBC, and I watched this uh, program called Hardball. Mm -hmm. It's with Chris Chris Matthews. I, I think he's really entertaining. <laughs> I, I don't agree with a lot of what he says, <coughs> but I think he says it so well. And he has this theme, uh, uh, which I think is really the core of this question. He has this theme that he always talks about, about America being um, the good power, America being a force for good in the world that he goes back to again and again, American exceptionalism. He's a strong believer in American exceptionalism. And I think this is the, uh, this generation's dilemma because the evidence is that that's not true. America, and, you know, when you really look at the evidence and if we're talking about a Latin America context, America is not a force for good. America is not the good imperialist. America's not. I had this conversation. Uh, I have a relationship with um, Venezuela. We have a dialogue. Uh, my, my organization 
uh, Southwest Voter Registration Project has a policy spinoff called the Willie Velasquez Institute that I also run. And we, we love the revolutionary countries, not because we're revolutionaries, although many people say I am, and they don't necessarily say it complimentary. I think they're the best learning experiences for training American leaders, which is what I do in part. And I remember 10 years ago, there was all this tumult in Venezuela, a coup that the uh, President Bush administration is tacitly supported, an oil strike, and, and I had a relationship with the ambassador here, and I told him, y'all better get ready. There's not a revolution in Latin America that has ever been left alone by the United States, and you're next. And he would like freak out when I would tell him that. And then the Middle East happened, and the United States was occupied with uh, the unending war that we're back in to. And that may have been the best thing that happened for, in particular, South America, because they got a 15-year period now of unfettered, comparatively unfettered development. And it's been very important for them. And they built a union, and they built a, their own development bank, and transfer wealth to the poor, and they haven't had any wars among themselves, and all these things are going on because our country didn't intervene. That's a terrible thing for Americans to have to like internalize. If we act, we're going to screw somebody. So maybe it's better not to act. And I don't know how to work that out in policy. But I think it's something that people really have to like cogitate on um, because there might not be a policy given the givens, right? What are Wall Street's prerogatives? What's the bipartisan establishment's prerogatives in terms of war and peace and hegemony and economic, quote unquote, economic development? What's our prerogatives in Latin America? Is there a good way to do it? And I can't say that there is. I haven't seen a way to do it well that works for both parties. But I have seen that when we're not engaged, there have been tremendous progress made in many of Latin American countries. And I, I just think we have to like admit it and take it from there. Elizabeth? And I think the issue there is for whom has US diplomacy worked in the past? Um, the United States, so let me just give you an example from my life in El Salvador right now. Every year on the 4th of July, there is a 4th of July party in whatever country you're in. We go to this party in a very poor country where many people are lacking food, and all it is is U.S. businesses. You know, you could have every type of food you want it. You could have Ruth Chris steak. You could have any type of liquor you want it. Wow. You could have any type of cheese from around the world. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking... Is this the type of outreach that the United States government needs to have in this country? How is this going to contribute to long-term, genuine economic and social development? And I think for too long, especially in this region of the world, U.S. diplomacy has been geared towards an elite and maintaining those elite. And the U.S. officials who are there don't know any better because they live in a bubble. They are literally not allowed to cross certain lines. Very nice lines. If you were only in Escalon, where they stay, right. you would think that El Salvador is an amazing, and, and I do think El Salvador is an amazing country, but you would think that it is a very safe place. And in fact, one of those government function funcionarios, uh, function functionaries, officials, officials came to me at this 4th of July party and she said, you know, I've been thinking about what you said, that these kids are fleeing violence because apparently that's hard to believe in the world's second most dangerous country in the world. And so I asked my maid if she was afraid to leave her home. <laughs> and I was just like, is, is that the only Salvadoran you know? That you're made? And it, it, it probably is the only Salvadoran she knows. Um, and part of that is because of the rules and the fear that they have speaking to security concerns. And part of that is because the US has not tried to engage at a grassroots level with what is working and what is not. And part of that is because of who they have contact with and that's the elite who want to maintain their power. Can we have one quick last question, that lady there in the orange shirt, and then we'll have to wrap it up. And actually, I mean, I don't want to ramble brief. on. Um, I actually wanted to recommend a book. It's called *The Right to Stay Home* by David Bacon. Mm -hmm. How U.S. policy drives Mexican migration, um, and it was just released this year. 
and it gives you a sense of a lot of the things we've been talking about, about the effect of NAFTA and these trade agreements that have just ruined the economy for a number of um, you know rural farmers who can't. It's not. It right. makes sense for them to grow to grow corn anymore because right. they're being you know they can't compete. And so when people are be starving, not and they're not just facing violence, they have to do something. And it's one of the things we never seem to talk about. We forget history. And you know, U.S. certainly our intervention in Latin America. I studied art history at UCLA, focusing on Latin America. You can't study it without looking at the political history. And it's history. It's what we've done, not just in Latin America, but all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you know. I love the U.S. I was born here. My great grandparents moved here from Mexico, um, but there are also a lot of problems. And when we don't talk about business interests, honestly, about capitalism, honestly, and it doesn't all have to be bad, but it's like we thrive because we exploit people and we support business interests. And those business interests are supreme above everything else. Do you have a, qu have a quick question? Or no, because you know what, because my question really was about, you know, you mentioned that there, this labor shortage, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of labor? Who are these people? Is it that we have a lack of population, like we stopped having babies? And I know we're not having quite as many, perhaps, yeah. as others. But what kind of labor? Low-wage labor, is that why we need those immigrants? So do we just want to have more people to exploit? I mean, that's the real. No, the, the, uh, the minute of the low wage, and then we got to leave. Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, it's a universal truth that the affluent countries of the world are not replacing themselves. See, there's not an exception to that rule. And in that scenario, if you want to have growth, I mean, can, you know, you, you, and, and we're, I think it's a, assume that we, uh, certainly in the Latino community, we want to have growth uh, because we, uh, uh, you know, have a gap between our wealth and the wealth of the white majority. So our answer is, well, you have to have uh, growth in order to get more uh, the kind of affluence that the white majority has you have to have more workers. It's just, you know, basic capitalism, more capital, more workers, more production, et cetera, et cetera. You have to have that. So if you uh, want to have a, a growing economy um, with growing uh, uh, prosperity to spread, we have a labor shortage. And it's a labor shortage at a variety of levels. It's not just cheap labor, but, but it includes cheap labor. It includes cheap labor. And uh, so it's uh, sort of logical to... Uh, um, uh, have an arrangement with countries that have a labor surplus. And by the way, that's not going to be Mexico after a while. Mexico is, uh, uh, despite the contradictions, has a growing uh, prosperity, again, despite the contradictions, and its birth rate is declining dramatically. And pretty soon Mexico won't be exporting labor uh, to the United States, and there will be other countries uh, that we'll have to work it out with. Quick, quick answer, do you think? Any any thoughts to that idea that we? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, many different thoughts. You know, um, I'm not objective about this because I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. Latinos tend to be very entrepreneurial. Yes, I, I mentioned we're the fastest growing segment of small business. They don't all stay small. I talked about the jobs that my father had. I mean, those were tough jobs, hard jobs, dirty jobs, ugly jobs. He didn't want those jobs, but that's what he had to do to move up and, and and eventually he was the business owner he was giving jobs to people i think you know look business is not perfect and business is not you know government and business is not a philanthropic organization but i think business has created incredible opportunities discoveries technology that has made our life better greater than it ever was you know i talk to my uh, my mom sometimes and, and she you know she, you know, when all that she reads and sees is bad news, and she thinks this is the worst time in the world, you know? That's what she thinks, and I say, it's not the worst time in the world. Yes, we have problems, and we know a lot more of, of suffering, and we need to deal with that. But, I mean, th th you know, I said, when you were growing up was the worst time in the world, you know? People didn't live as long. We had world wars. Millions of people were dying. There wasn't the opportunities. People were dying in the street uh, because of illness, because of starvation. I said, so yeah, we, we gotta deal with our issues, but I think that um, business can be, should be, has been uh, part of the solution. It's not the entire solution, it's part of the solution. A quick last word from Elizabeth. 
I would just say that your concerns are correct because of the children that I've interviewed, one of the questions is what are your parents doing or what is your family member doing in the United States? And oftentimes they are undocumented and they are working in very low wage <coughs> labor. Nonetheless, to address the point of cash uh, transfers, they are remitting a large portion of their money because they do care so much about their families and their communities problematically, they are targeted for extortion. So we do not know to what extent the remittances are benefiting these communities because for the moment, a large amount of that money is actually going to the gangs. They are able to mm. hold the Western Union or other transfer company at gunpoint and ask for the list, and they run elaborate extortion schemes, which even the FBI has helped to prosecute transnationally. So I don't think that that's going to be a, a successful solution for the moment until security is under control. But yes, yeah, so many of these people are going to very low-wage labor because Central American migrants are different from Mexican migrants or South American migrants. They are the most likely not to have documentation because they are so impoverished. About 20% of the parent or the children that I met applied for a visa and were rejected because of a lack of economic resources. Um, so you're very right to be concerned about the exploitative labor that they usually end up working in. Well, I thank all of you for joining us here tonight, and we're going to have coffee up in the lobby. You can continue the conversation with our guests there. <laughs> <laughs>